Welcome to my review for Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare, the much maligned sixth film in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. I only just saw this film for the first time the other night, but I've been hearing for years how terrible it is. Worst film in the world, worst sequel in the world, the death knell of a franchise, all sorts of dubious honours. So I wasn't looking forward to watching it, not least because of the fact that I hated number five. In fact, I was waiting for a particular type of night to watch this. So I wanted to make sure I had beers in the house because I don't always, I usually drink beers as soon as I get them. And secondly, I wanted to make sure that it was a night where I had time to watch at least two movies. That way, Freddy's Dead couldn't ruin my evening. So eventually there came a night where the preconditions were met. So I put the film on and to my absolute amazement, I didn't hate it as much as I thought I was going to. I actually thought it was OK. Not great, but OK. And I think I've got just as many positives to talk about today as negatives. I will start with a negative just to appease people who have turned up expecting a piss take, maybe even hoping for a piss take. So let's talk about the over the top humour in this film and the fact that Freddy is in it way too much, because those are things that people often complain about when it comes to the later Nightmare on Elm Street sequels. I totally agree. There is way too much zaniness and humour, not just in this film, but also in the one before it. And it all comes to a head for me in the death of Spencer scene in the video game. Now, I'm a big gamer when I'm not reviewing movies, and it really annoys me whenever games are misrepresented, not just in movies, but in anything. And you can tell watching this sequence that whoever wrote this film did not play video games themselves back in 1991. You can tell that they've just tried to blag the writing of the scene rather than actually consult somebody who played games themselves. But it's not just that. There's so many things wrong with the way that this kill has been directed and presented. I don't get why Spencer is pogoing all over the house. It's so annoying and distracting from the main business of watching him in the game. I don't get why we're watching Freddy with the controller so much. Why are we not focused more on Spencer in the game, seeing the look of fear on his face and following his progress of what he's doing. He's reduced to just being a tiny little sprite. There's no tension in what's going on at all. And when it comes to the way that he dies, well, let me tell you, over the past 30 years, I probably died hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times in video games, but I have never died by falling into a batch of oversized erect spoons. Not to my knowledge anyway. Strangely though, the other two kills in the film are absolutely brilliant. They're two of my favourite kills from the entire franchise actually. The one where John falls to his death, that's a two-parter actually. So in the beginning of the film he's falling and rolling and he, and he gets away that time, but later on he has another dream sequence where he goes through much the same experience except this time he dies. On a personal level, I must admit, I myself have had dreams, or should I say nightmares, where I've been falling, falling, falling. I think it might be something to do with the fact that I'm afraid of planes. So I could relate to John's experiences in this film, and it gave me goose flesh actually watching these scenes play out. I didn't expect a film like Freddy's Dead to begin this way with, with such a nervy sequence from my point of view. You know, I was expecting crass silliness from the off, you know, Freddy killing somebody with acid fired from a posy or something and going, <laughs> uh, I wasn't expecting to see John on a plane and then the falling. As is typical with a movie like this, though, it can't help trying to ruin even the, the things that it does well. So in the first of the John sequences, there's a moment where Freddy flies past on a broomstick dressed as a witch. It's just stupid and it does nothing for the scene. And later on in the second of the John sequences, just as he's falling to his death, Freddy brings out a bed of nails why do this? He's already going to die an horrific death. Why spoil it a little bit with a cheap joke? But on the whole, I, I still really enjoyed those John scenes because they really hit the spot for me. The other kill I've not yet mentioned is probably better on a technical level. I, I don't really have anything to criticise about the one where the guy develops oversensitive ears and then his head explodes. It wasn't as scary for me as the, as the John death, but it was still extremely good. The story is also a mixture of the good, the bad and the ugly, but there is good. I liked the whole apocalyptic approach in this, this idea that Freddy has, over the course of many years, killed all the teenagers in Springwood. This was a good development for me. I think it just adds to Freddy's horror legacy that he's achieved this. I like the moment where he pops up the Elm Street sign and says, there's an Elm Street in every town, and then he pledges to sort of carry on killing in all the 
all the other states. It sort of makes sense for him that he would want to do that rather than retire. It's sort of odd that in the in the same film where that they're retiring the character, you know, with the whole Freddy R.I.P. thing at the end, they're also expanding his horizons potentially at the same time. Because if there had been a number seven after this, they could have had him pop up terrorising people in Hawaii or New York, anywhere, if they'd have carried on making more films. Now, some of the smaller details about the plot don't work as well as the, the overall details. I've been puzzling for two days how it is that Freddy could kill all these kids, potentially hundreds and thousands of teenagers over many, many years, give them all these unexplainable deaths as far as the rest of the world is concerned. And yet nobody outside of Springwood seems to be noticing this because in the next town over, they're completely clueless as to what's been going on. Now, even in the pre-internet days, this makes no sense to me unless the FBI and the police have been covering it up somehow. But if that's the case, why have they allowed a statue to be planted that commemorates the missing kids? Uh, it just doesn't make any logical sense. Also, I don't get why all the remaining adults in Springwood seem to be on LSD or something, just acting stupid. It happens several times during the film. I'm thinking, why are you acting like that? That's not what grief is like, if, if that's what it's meant to be. So it's like they came up with this really good plot for Freddy Six, and yet at the same time, they couldn't quite be bothered ironing out all the finer details. I did like the fact that they bring Freddy's daughter into it. I know some people, for some people that might not be their cup of tea, but I think it was a good way to end the series having his daughter turn up rather than it just be yet another final girl battling with him in the last 10 minutes. I think it's logical that Freddy could have had a daughter at some point because he would have had a normal life for a while. It's not like he's a Michael Myers or a Jason Voorhees, two people who have definitely at no point had a normal adult life. Freddy Krueger was a married man, we think, and he, he could have had a daughter. Why not? So... That worked for me. I did like the flashback sequences where we see him and his daughter in the garden. I was totally into the movie at that point. I enjoyed those moments. Another controversial opinion now, but I quite liked the introduction of the dream demon things, which supposedly hired Freddy in the first place. I think what sold me on this concept was the way that it was introduced. So seeing Yafik Koto staring at this H.R. Geiger-esque photo on the wall was quite creepy. And then later on, there's a good use of practical effects when we see the demons presented as these fire piranha things swimming through Freddy's brain. I thought that was quite cool. I like the fact that they don't bother to explain how Freddy comes back in this film. I was getting sick of all the bullshit reasons we get in 4 and 5 as to how he's able to return. But if these demons are canon now, then maybe they're just some higher power able to bring Freddy back no matter what legitimate reasons Kristen and Nancy and the like think they found to banish him. Now, I mentioned Yafik Koto just now. I could not believe when he popped up on the screen. He was one of my favourite childhood actors. He was a villain in Live and Let Die. He was in Alien, one of my favourite horror films of all time. He was in The Running Man, one of my favourite Arnold Schwarzenegger films from the 80s. Nobody told me that Yafik Koto was in Freddy's Dead. I could not believe it. In terms of the other characters, the main characters, they're okay, but they do bicker a lot in the first sort of 30, 40 minutes. There's a scene where John just loses his top with Maggie for no reason. There are scenes when Tracy loses her top with people for absolutely no reason. She seems to cheer up a bit in the, in the second half of the film when she realises there's a killer after a go figure. On the whole, I'm willing to give these people a pass in terms of their characterisation, despite some dodgy acting. I guess the main thing is the fact that the Maggie we get here is good. That was essential. When it comes to the issue of whether I give this film a pass or not, I guess I will by the thinnest of razor margins. I did not expect to feel this way coming into this experience. Like I said, I did not even understand the story of, of part five, but I guess number six just had nothing to lose with me in a weird way. A bit like Rocky in, in Rocky One going to fight Apollo Creed. You know, he, he had nothing to lose. This film had nothing to lose with me. Every time I saw a little bit in it that I enjoyed, it was like, whoa, I actually enjoyed that bit. Whoa, I actually enjoyed that bit, you know. But even if I'd watched this after Dream Master, I still think I would have enjoyed it. On Rotten Tomatoes, this film has a score of 19%. That's a higher figure than I expected, given the film's reputation. I guess then that four in every five people don't like the movie and one in every five sort of do. I'm in that camp that sort of do. I don't love it or hugely respect it, but I had a good time with it. I think it's a decentish end to the franchise or a decentish end to this timeline 
And most importantly, the story is enjoyable to follow, it's engrossing. The most important thing in any film really is the story. Yes, it's full of crap, bad humour, illogical things, dodgy actors here and there, but I was a satisfied customer at the end. It was okay. Right, shall we get to the Bag of Terror so I can stop rambling? Yes, I think we should do. Right, I can't believe I'm doing this, but Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, with me, scores three bloody axes out of five. I'm now going to go and cower under a rock before anybody can leave any negative comments. Cheerio, bye-bye. <laughs>